I just want to get on to introducing our last speaker, Ken Wong. Ken is uh, the lead, a lead designer at Us2. Uh, and like so many people, I'm a huge fan of the game he created, Monument Valley. Uh, which won nearly every award in the book. Um, and like so, like, there are so many games that are kind of escapist and fantastical, but Monument Valley was really um, very perceptual. Uh, and the physics and the rules of the game were kind of close to those of our own world, but then just subtly different, um, in such that it kind of made you see the world in a new way. Um, and it also had such a tremendous artistry and a, and a rhythm and a pacing that was really unique and deliberate and almost meditative. So. Um, he's going to bring all of those gifts to a new game called Land's End uh, uh, in, for VR, and he's going to almost sort of premiere it here today for us, so we're very excited. Um, and please join me in welcoming a great artist, Ken Wong. Thank you. That's a, that was a great intro. Um, wow. Thanks for coming today. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, for Google. Um, my name is Ken Wong. I'm a lead designer at US2 uh, on the games team. And for the past 16 months, we've been working on, on this, this project called Land's End. And Land's End is a game, or it's, it's something like a game, uh, and it's designed to, and, and to be played just in virtual reality. It's not an iPhone game. It's not a console game. It's, it's specifically designed for VR. Um, and we're excited because VR is an entirely new medium. Um, and traditional game developers face an entirely new set of challenges when developing for VR. And so I'm going to talk about some of that today and some of the solutions that we uh, developed along the way. Um, so I love Google Image Search. Who here loves Google Image Search? I use it every day. And one of the great things about it, I think, is that it gives you an idea of the public consciousness, right? It's, it's searching the web for the most, the most popular, the most relevant results for any particular term. And when I did a Google image search for virtual reality, the number one result is this. <laughs> so who, what's, what's going on here? Who is this guy? Um, he's like, he's got blueprints in the background. He's got like lasers coming out of his eyes. There's like this futuristic laser HUD going on. He's got like matrix glasses. This, this is the number one result, right? So this is, in, in, in a small way, in one particular way, this is the public face of VR. And the rest of the results on the first page, you know, aren't that much better. We've got, you know, guy putting his face through a laptop. Uh, we've got, you know, floating HUDs. We've got some weird green neon space. We've got a guy with a gun. We've got more lasers coming out of people's faces. Um, this, for better or worse, this is what some people perceive to be VR. Um, the public perception of VR, I think, is also affected by depictions of computer space or virtual space in popular media. So a lot of that dates back to the 80s and 90s when we had movies like The Lawnmower, Lawnmower Man, like Tron, uh, like The Matrix. And it seems that in a lot of these depictions, we've got um, AIs run rampant, destroying everything. We've got conflicts, uh, and we've got these kind of male power fantasies about you know what you could do if you could like control reality. Um, and you know that's that's, some, that's really geeky stuff. I'm a, I'm a geek. I love all this stuff, but it's not necessarily for everyone. Um, but times, times moved along, um, literally. Uh, VR managed to get on to the cover of Time magazine this year uh, in August. But a lot of people would say that this is not, this is not really the message that we want to put out. This is not necessarily the most flattering depiction of virtual reality that, that we could have at this time. Uh, that's Palmer Lucky, who uh, kick-started the Oculus Rift at the age of 20. Um, so when I'm, when I'm here today to talk to you guys about VR for everyone, what I'm really talking about is how we can use design to affect the public perception and therefore the adoption of this new technology. So um, here's the fun, scary bit of the talk where I need a volunteer. So can I have, does anyone want to try Land's End? Not you, because you work for my company. <laughs> but... Um, this guy, this guy right here. Hi. Oh, 
not that guy, sorry. What's your name? I'm Adam. Hi, Adam. Um, what's your experience with VR? Um, I've played a little bit with Oculus Rift. Okay, cool. So you're not a, not a total virgin then. Not total. All right, so... Not that way, anyway. But you haven't played Land's End? <laughs> uh, no, no. Okay, really, cool. I really want to. Okay, so um, I have a headset here. And we're going to... This is really scary for me because we've never done this like publicly live before. So um, I'd, I'd love to share you know, Land's End with all of you here in the room with a device. But unfortunately, I just have one device here. So we're going we're gonna to put it on Adam. And we're going to watch like a simulation of what he's seeing. Um, let's check that that's working. Yeah. So actually, there's a, there's a ring on the top which you can use to adjust focus. Okay, cool. Just maybe step a little bit back from the wall. Sure. How's that feeling? So the the simulation is a little bit a little bit uh, janky. The the um, the refresh rate is not as great as as, as it is in the headset. Uh, but what you're seeing is is it's kind of it's a 2D simulation. This is the 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 Unity editor uh, showing a 2D representation of what Adam's seeing. Adam is seeing things all around. He's controlling everything with his head, uh, with no hand controls. And no instruction. I haven't told him. I, I just met you today, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and he's just working out what to do by himself, which which we feel is a really important part of, of what we do. And if you'll notice, um, he's navigating the space and and doing things by by looking at these points and the way that we help the player. Uh, work through this is there's kind of a rim light around this and this is sort of this is I'll come back to this later about how we develop this They're laugh they're not laughing at you they're laughing with you don't worry. <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> All right, can I stop you there? All right, thanks very much <laughs> Woo! Okay, I'm glad, I'm really glad that went okay because I've never done that before. <laughs> so. Okay, so welcome back to the real world. Um, so before I dive into some of the problems uh, that we face developing Land's End and some of the solutions that we came up with, I'd like to backtrack a little bit and talk about uh, our company, us two, and uh, where we came from and uh, why we decided to take on this project in the first place. So Us2 is not a games company. Us2 is a digital product studio. Uh, we have about 250 people, of which 11 of us are on the games team. Um, and we make uh, apps and other interactive solutions for clients around the world, um, apps for smartphones, uh, web solutions, um, and design like uh, smartphone, uh, smartwatch faces and icons. Um, but aside from our client work, we do a lot of uh, projects and initiatives on, on the side. Uh, we do joint ventures. Um, in the case of Wayfinder, we're working with the, um, the Royal London Society for Blind People to create an app that helps people uh, navigate um, urban spaces by themselves. Uh, we produce documentation for free, like Pixel Perfect Precision, which is a tool to help digital designers. And we create own IP apps, like Rando, the anti-social photo sharing app, which is no longer available because of a Russian hacker. <laughs> and of course, we have the games team. The games team has been around for several years. And it's produced uh, many games, um, some like Whale Trail, which have met um, a decent amount of success. Um, some are like Bliplup, which kind of failed to ignite audiences. But that's okay, because we had a lot of fun making it. And it, it's, we think that having side projects like this within us two really helps uh, keep our creative culture uh, going. Uh, and we learned a lot from this experience. And the next game that we made was this game, Monument Valley. Um, and Monument Valley was a pretty 
a, a bigger success than Whale Trail. Um, we got a bunch of awards, um, including an Apple Design Award. We were iPad Game of the Year. Uh, we got two BAFTAs. But actually, the achievement that we're proudest of is that the game was able to make such a big impact with a really wide audience. Um, we, this was kind of unintended. You know, we thought that we were just making a pretty game for hipsters. You know, we're making a game for you guys, like the design crowd. You guys have, have digital devices. You're, you, 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 you buy apps. But you know, as the games team at us two, we wanted to make sure that our whole company was included. Um, and so we thought, you know, how can we make a game that, um, that you, know, you guys, digital, digital designers, might like, um, even though you're not game players, you're not necessarily gamers. So we tried to make it accessible, as accessible as possible, right? Using, using UX, using good game design. Uh, and we found, we, we, the feedback that we got was that, you know, kids as young as three could play the game. Uh, we heard that children as young as six could finish the game by themselves. And a lot of people told us that their, their parents or their grandparents uh, were getting into the game and, and were interested. And for a lot of people, this was the first game that they ever finished, um, which probably has something to do with us making the game quite short and easy. Because we felt that, um, you know, unlike other games, we, we wanted people to make sure that they get to the end. We didn't want difficulty or like testing people's skills to get in the way of the story and, and the beauty of the game. So, um, so really, this was really fulfilling. And, um, and we kind of accidentally made this game for everybody, everyone. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people ask us, you know, if, if this was so fulfilling to you guys, if this is something you care about, bringing gaming to a really broad audience, then why create for VR? It's this niche technology, and, and so few people have the particular device that we're creating for. Why, why, are you, why are you getting into this now? And I was asking this question, you know, I was asking my teammates of this because I was fully against the project to begin with. You know, I was a huge skeptic of VR. Um, VR doesn't particularly work on me very well. Um, I think it's this fiddly, immature technology that, you know, so few people use. But, um, but you know, you know I, the, my teammates were very passionate about it, so we started, we started looking into it. So here's the, the state of VR in 2015, actually not that different to how it was last year when we started the project. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Oculus Rift. Um, it's uh, developed by Oculus, which was uh, kickstarted and then later bought by Facebook. Um, and it's still in development. Um, it's it's a, a bunch of developer kits have gone out, um, but the, the full retail kit is coming uh, early next year. We've got the HTC Vive, which is developed in conjunction with Valve, one of the, the foremost uh, game developers in the world. We have the PlayStation VR. So this is Sony getting into the act and hooking this up with the PlayStation 4 uh, in order to create console uh, VR. And there's this thing called Google Cardboard, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, which is great. Um, and you know, looking at this landscape, you have these three really high-end, quite expensive uh, systems aimed, aimed mostly at, at high-level gaming, right? So you've got people with, with high-end next-gen PCs or consoles um, plugging in uh, this, this new headset technology. At the other end, you've got um, Google Cardboard, which is really affordable, really easy to distribute, um, and is purposely designed for, for short stints, right? There's no head strap, so it's really intended so that you're, you're going to take a look in it, go into another world, and then come out of it. But um, what really got us passionate and excited was, was this, the Samsung Gear VR. Uh, powered by Oculus. Now, I'm going to sound a bit like a salesman when I talk about this, <laughs> because in order for us, for people to play Land's End, they have to buy this. So, so Samsung Gear VR, guys. Um, <laughs> and Samsung Gear VR is, is, is a, it's a collaboration between Samsung and Oculus, and it only works with these four uh, smartphones, the Galaxy S6, S6 Edge, S6 Edge Plus, and the Note 5. And why we love the Gear VR so much is, first of all, there's no wires. Um, the, the three high-end sets that, that you saw before, what we think of as desktop VR or, or console VR, they have a tether 
or an umbilical cord coming out the back of your head and joining into your living room or your bedroom uh, setup, right? Um, and when they demo this, they often have an assistant who's kind of holding the wire to make sure you didn't get tangled up. Um, the fact that the Gear VR has no wire, no tether, means that you can create a full 360 experience, right? You can, you know, as, as you saw Adam, he can turn all the way around without getting tangled up. And that really helps fulfill part of the promise of VR, which is fully explorable worlds. We think that that's, that's really important. Uh, the fact that um, the Gear VR is portable means a lot to us. You know, we are sort of in the field of mobile games, and mobile games are great because they're, it's, it's kind of a, a lower commitment gaming experience, right? You don't have to invest in dedicated hardware. You can take it anywhere. You can play it for short times on public transport. And, and we think that these strengths are also applicable to the Gear VR. Um, you know, in the past year, we've taken our Gear VRs to the beach, to the park, to people's houses. Uh, we've even shown it in line when people are queuing up for the high-end VR experiences. We just say, like, oh, I've got this thing in my bag. You can just try it now. Um, I, was, I was showing it around at dinner last night. And this means that it's, it's great for, for showing people VR, for, for showing them a lot of people for the first time, their first ever VR experience. And usually what happens is we pass it along, along the room to, to friends, and, and it becomes actually a more social experience. Um, the Gear VR is more affordable. It's um, uh, if you already have, have if you already are an Android phone user, you know these are the most po most popular Android handsets. <laughs> Apart from that, the headset is only ninety nine dollars, which you can pre order now, um, <laughs> which makes it more accessible. Right, this is VR uh, for everyone, not just for the high end Matrix geeks. And I know what you're thinking. The, all of these things are applied to Google Cardboard. Uh, the last point is that it's, it's powerful enough. So as, as game developers, you know, what we really want to focus on is creating amazing experiences. And fragmentation really kind of hampers that, right? When you have tons of platforms, some of them are like legacy devices, older devices that aren't as powerful. That makes development much harder. Um, so the fact that this is geared towards the, the current gen of, of good Android phones um, makes our development life uh, so much easier. We don't have to worry about, um, you know, plugging just any device uh, into cardboard right now. So with this idea, we um, we scoped out an initial project. We thought that, yeah, well, it's this side project. We're going to spend like three months on it. Uh, we'll we'll release in a couple of months in September, 2014. And it's you know it's not necessarily geared to make money, but it's gonna it's gonna gain some traction because we think of it as a cousin of Monument Valley. Um, it's not necessarily a sequel, it's not necessarily in the same universe, but we're going to build on some of the lessons that we learned, some of the same themes. Um, and, you know, what we think uh, was really su successful about Monument Valley is we built a game that was specifically designed for touch devices. So Monument Valley is not a console game or a PC game that we ported over to the iPad or the iPhone. It was really designed first and foremost, to be held in your hands, played in portrait on with, with touch gestures. And so we applied the same thing to, to Gear VR. We looked specifically at this headset, at this ecosystem, and, and the efficiencies and advantages that it provided, and we thought, how, how can we design around this? And the first thing that you need to know when you're designing for any VR is that motion sickness is a big problem. Um, it's, it's a lot like car sickness. It's, it's where what you're seeing and what your body is doing is different. If there's too much of a disconnect, your body freaks out and, and makes you nauseous. Um, and, you know, interestingly, people experience this in different ways. Some people are really sensitive to this. Some people are totally immune. Some people feel more discomfort uh, when they're going upstairs. Some feel more discomfort going downstairs. So we really do a lot of testing to try and figure out, you know, how can we make sure that people are nice and comfortable in this so they don't tear it off their heads and vomit. Um, unlike uh, other games, we have to take a lot of physicality to uh, into consideration. So uh, a lot of computer games, you're just sitting in a chair and you're playing with a keyboard or with a control pad. Uh, in this case, you've got a headset, you know, strapped around your head. Um, you've got headphones on. And you're, you're looking around, you're, you're moving your, sometimes your whole body, 
and, uh, and it's encompassing your whole vision. So it's, it's kind of more exhausting, and, and, in, and we can actually ask the player to, to be stretching in, in, in different ways. So we have to just take that into account. We find that, uh, that gaze is, or where the player is looking, is the, most, uh, the, the best tool that the player has. Because we do that all the time, right, in real life. We use it, we're, we're always looking at things, focusing on things in real life. And, and we have, we're used to that, we have good motor control for that. Perhaps even better than you know, trying to memorize finger gestures with your, with your hands. Uh, so we really focus uh, a lot on that, and we're trying to make use of that in our game design. Even though it's not perfect. So the Gear VR uh, tracks the angle that your head is tilting at, but it doesn't track position. So in, in Land's End, you can't lean, and you, you can't look at things like this. Uh, and we don't track, we don't do any eye tracking. So, uh, you know, fortunately, Adam here learnt pretty quickly to move his head to look at things, but you can't look up and look down and, and navigate in that way. Um, so it's not perfect, and that, al that also, that imperfection contributes to motion sickness. Uh, as you'll, you'll quickly realize that the existing UI paradigms don't work because the screen has gone away, right? You don't, the, you don't have a 2D screen, there's no edges of the screen. The world is all around you, the user experience is all around you. And it's, it's in 3D, it has depth. So we have to kind of rethink how we're going to relay uh, information and, and interfaces um, for, the, for this new medium. Um, unlike a lot of other gaming, we can better assume that people have headphones. Um, with mobile, you know, people just kind of don't care. Maybe they're on the tube they're, or they're on the toilet, and they're not necessarily wearing headphones. Uh, uh, but because you know, you're not, you, you probably don't want to be hearing the phone output when you've got this headset on, people, in our experience, are usually using headphones, and that allows our sound designer to, to put a lot more work in and, and make the most of of what's available. Um, we found that in VR, everything is more amplified, right? Everything is stronger and more intense and more powerful because it's, it's really there. Like you feel like it's right there and it's all around you. So even simple interactions like, like, like picking an object up or, um, you know, or, or, going, or just moving throughout the world, that feels, that feels stronger. And, and everything just glistens and feels looks more beautiful because it's, it's right there instead of being in a TV screen you know, a few feet away from you. That's great because that'll, that means instead of having to make really bombastic, out of this world, over the top video games, we can be a lot more subtle. We have a, a much more subtle toolbox to work with. Um, I think for a lot of people, the fantasy of VR, the promise of VR is being able to navigate totally virtual spaces or, or spaces that are, that, are, that are away from us. Um, but like I said, the, you know, motion sickness is difficult, the interface is challenging. Um, but if we can overcome that, then moving around a virtual space is, 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 a, real, is a really powerful thing. Um, lastly, you know, um, the Apple App Store is, has, is sometimes really difficult to, to develop for because it's such a crowded marketplace and it's full of free games and the Google Play has some of the same problems. Uh, these types of experiences for Gear VR are in a, a whole new app store, the Oculus Store, and that allows us to kind of reset the conversation and reset player expectations, um, ex reset expectations about what they expect for certain price points. Um, so we're really optimistic about that. We were really fortunate um, that our tech director, Peter Pashley, uh, figured out very early on in the project uh, a really good solution to a lot of these issues, which is what we call look points. So as you saw with Adam, the basic mechanic of, of Land's End is looking at these points of light guided by sort of this, this focus ring around the lights to kind of guide you towards looking at them. And we found that this was, this was quite intuitive. We could give this to someone without any instruction, and you know, they'd start looking around and then focus in on these little points of light. And so it's not total freedom. You know, a lot of people say they, they'd love to be able to ro roam around this world uh, with total freedom, but this is, this is pretty good. We can put points around the world and, and allow the player to move in between them. Um, this is called Water City. This is the first... I'm just going to turn that down a bit. 
This is the first uh, demo, playable demo that we had, which we actually had in August of last year, so over a year ago. And it's actually pretty solid. You can, you can move around the world. It looks pretty good. You can see that we're using a lot of uh, Monument Valley assets as placeholders. And, uh, but we really we struggled to develop a full game out of this demo. You know, we thought we had some things right, but there were still a lot of design problems that we, we struggled to overcome. And at the same time, um, Samsung kept pushing back the release of the final device uh, one month at a time. You know, they initially told us to, to be ready for a launch in September of 2014. And um, they kept extending it. And every time, we decided to extend our, our project length. Um, eventually, an Innovators Edition was released in December of 2014, uh, paired with the Galaxy Note 4. But we still we felt like we didn't have anything that we were comfortable with releasing. So what, what took us so long? Like why, you know, we, we thought that three months would be enough to come up with like a really nice little experience. But um, you know, first and foremost, we we had this problem where we were trying to balance um, gameplay, uh, like using your skills, trying to figure out puzzles with just doing a purely visual experience. We knew that we could probably make something about just moving around beautiful worlds and just, just taking in the landscape. But we knew from Monument Valley that people really like interacting. They like the feeling, at least, of, of being smart and solving puzzles. So trying to get that balance was, was really tough for us. Um, we struggled to develop puzzle mechanics that don't require any explanation. You know, look points worked well, but uh, beyond that, trying to figure out how to gate the player, how to prevent them, how to create obstacles for them, that was, was really difficult. Because if we can create difficult puzzles. That's the easy bit. Um, but you don't want to be frustrated in VR, right? Because you put this thing on your head, and you're in this totally other world. It's beautiful. And you don't want to be sitting there at a puzzle going, like, what, what am I not seeing? Like I've, and then you're trying everything over and over again. Uh, you want these puzzles to have just enough friction that you're, you, know, you have to stop and, and look closely, but not so much friction that people get stuck in the same room for 10 minutes. Um, we, again, the, the motion sickness comes back again. We, we know that we have to make this a, as gentle and as comfortable as possible, but we also didn't want the experience to be boring or slow. So we had to try and, and, and balance that and try and find ways to kind of mask how slow and, and, and how limited the movement really is. And finally, you know, our level designs just weren't really cutting it. You know, they, they function. You could, you could get users from the start to the end of the levels. But um, they didn't, they there didn't seem to be the sense of progression. You didn't feel the same satisfaction that, that we gave users in Monument Valley. And it didn't really feel like a lived-in world. And so this is evidence of, of a lot of the development work that we did. Um, we, we, tried, we tried tons of levels. Every time that we came up with a new idea, we had to build a level around it to test it out. You know, we can't test these mechanics in isolation. We kind of have to test the whole user experience. So these are all um, levels that didn't end up in the game. These are just test ideas. Some of them we spent a lot of time on. Uh, but, you know, but that's OK, because um, it's, it's all for the purpose of learning how to make a good land's end level. And this process was very familiar to us. We, we went through this on Monument Valley. This is a collection of uh, some of the ideas and mechanics and, and story ideas from Monument Valley that didn't make it into the game. None of this is, is in the game. Um, so eventually, you know, it took us many, many months, uh, but we arrived at some solutions to these problems. Um, we realized that uh, there's this middle ground of interactions rather than puzzles where, uh, again, I, exp I said that things in, v in VR feel more intense than they, than they do in a regular game. And we found that just interacting with things was interesting enough. You know, people got satisfaction just moving things around and joining the dots together. We didn't need to necessarily have complex puzzles that required problem-solving skills. So we knew that you know, people were OK with just interacting and, and moving on uh, between the sites. Um, we kind of came back to this, the, the principles of, of Monument Valley, which we'd somehow forgotten, which is we should be designing levels with spectacle and progression in mind. So from the very beginning, we should kind of treat it like a user experience, like a user story. 
And we know that we want to create these points of, of high intensity and, and, and spectacle and, and interest. And between them, we're kind of having these, these uh, you know, traveling from point to point and kind of lower intensity things. And once we went back to that approach, our, our levels just felt a lot better. Um, and finally, uh, we found that we tried lots of different interaction mechanisms um, uh, beyond the look points. And it was really when we discovered, when we realized that you know, gaze is the strongest thing, gaze is what we, what we is the strongest thing about um, current VR, we figured out these two systems, uh, star lines and draggers. So star lines, uh, again, makes use of gaze. But instead of moving from point to point, you are connecting the dots. And uh, it took a lot of development uh, figuring out you know, that Triangle was the start point and, and circle is the end point. But we're trying to teach people that they have to go from start to finish, connecting all the dots. Um, it looks so simple, but this is, this is uh, what we arrived at. And it's fairly intuitive. Um, you will see that, that uh, Adam was able to, to figure out at least the first puzzle by himself. Um, and secondly, draggers. So we knowing that we can look at things with the center of our vision. We, th we, we experimented early on with just moving things up and down or left to right, a lot like how Monument Valley works. And then at some point, we realized that we could connect this with physics and just have physics objects moving around with some constraints. And as soon as we tried that, we were like, oh my god, this, this is it. This is, this is so much more fun than anything we've done before because of the, the innate fun of physics. And we, it took a lot of fine tuning to uh, to work out the interface of how you're going to grab onto these objects, how you're going to let go, um, being able to finally place uh, objects. But when, when it's right, when it's working right, it really feels like you're using the force or like you're a magneto in X-Men. So that's, that's, a, that's a really magical moment that, that worked well for us. Um, the final part of, of how we make games that I'd like to talk about is user testing. Um, we, we think that user testing is incredibly important. It's part of what we learned from being a games team embedded within a UX studio. Um, so right from the beginning, from as soon as we had our playable prototype, we were showing the games to our, our colleagues at us two who don't normally play games um, and saying, you know what, it doesn't matter if you play games, it doesn't matter if you suck at games. That's, a, that's actually better because if you can put this on and figure out what to do, um, then we've done our job, right? We've created an intuitive user interface, a, an intuitive user experience. So we're always testing, we're, you know, and the portability is great for this, right? We, we, we now take the year of yards wherever we go, we, and we show people at dinner parties, uh, we show it when we go to people's houses, we take it on, on holidays, just to get as much input as possible and with, a, with a, as wide an audience as possible. Um, and uh, just before uh, I wrap up, I'd just like to share with you our release trailer, because uh, personally, I want to hear it with this great sound system. <laughs> Um, so the game is out now. It actually came out two days ago. So if you happen to have a Gear VR Innovators Edition, or if you would like to pre-order the Consumer Edition <laughs> of the Gear VR, then our, our game is now ready on the store. 
So um, I'd, I'd just like to come back to this, this question um, of why create for VR, why now? Because I think by the end of the project, our, our motivations had kind of shifted. Um, I think I realized along the way that VR is not just a new form of gaming. You know, people are like, is this the future of gaming? Is this, is all gaming going to now be in this form? And I think it's actually different. It's, it's an entirely new medium. You know, we have people coming to VR from architecture uh, and from film and from other areas. And, it's, and that's awesome because we can all meet in the middle because this is something entirely new. And, you know, video games have always struggled because I think video games have this ancestry in amusement and diversion, right? The first video games, they, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're trivial. They're meant to be a way to pass time or to, or to test our skills. And, and that's cool. You know, that's, that's the kind of games that I grew up with, and it's great. It's a great culture to be invested in, like these virtual games. But, the, and, and, but we struggle to, to tell people that actually, you know, you can make games that are more than that. You can make games that are meaningful and can make a difference and that aren't violent and that are more inclusive. Um, that's something that, that, you know, 30, 30, 35 years of gaming culture now has to kind of reverse. But VR is, is this new thing, and I think that VR, because VR is about telepresence, right? VR is about being in another world and seeing this virtual world through someone else's eyes. Um, VR is intrinsically promoting learning and new experiences and empathy. Um, I, th I think this is wonderful. I think that gaming is just one small part of this, and now is the time that we can be using our skills, our design skills, um, to be laying a solid foundation um, to, and to set a direction for the medium uh, and to maximize the potential of VR. Thank you very much for, for listening.